there's a really common misconception out there that I want to address. You save your file and you pack it up. That process is not actually saving your PA's audio settings. So can I just ask you a bunch of random questions like off the top of my head and we'll just see what happens? Sure. What's the best way to store cables, like a Velcro tie or <laughs> shoelace? Uh, I prefer trickline. I feel like the Velcro is always sticking on itself and getting in the way. I like trickline. That way, you always have a whole bunch of spare trickline pieces in case you need them. Okay. How'd you meet your wife? How did I meet my wife? Her brother is a sound engineer in San Francisco, where oh. I lived at the time. And she also lived? Uh, no. She came over for his wedding. To visit. Okay. And I was the best man. And he told me, before I met her, to not get any funny ideas. So, really, it's his <laughs> fault. Because <laughs> that incepted you with the funny ideas. <laughs> Instantly. I should ask, what's your name? Hi, I'm Nick. <laughs> and uh, where are we? We are at The Dojo, the which Dojo. is DMB's training facility in Asheville, North Carolina. And that's not just a clever name, right? This used to be a real yeah. dojo. Yeah, yeah, back before we took this part of the building over, there was an actual karate dojo. Karate. And so we just referred to it as The Dojo. And then they left. We took over the lease. We knocked down a wall between the buildings. And then it was like, we're going to The Dojo. Cool. And, and here now we are. there are... Classes, training, anything else? This is where you come to get a D in black belt. D in black belt. There's a lot of puns around here. Yes, there the is. The D and bottle. Yep, the D and bottle. I also have a D and umbrella. Okay. Yeah. Just random other things I was thinking of. So I recently took several of the D and B trainings. And one of the things we learned is that when you turn on array processing, there is a like a standard target that always gets used. And I just found myself recently wondering, what does that look like? Can I look at it? And is there a mm -hmm. place where I can see that? There is. On array calc, when you turn on array processing and you have the dialog for it open, it will show you before and after spectral responses of the PA, which will include the target curve. Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing about the target curve. That is not a target curve of the PA. It is a target curve of the PA at the seats. So it's automatically compensating for distances and different arrays with different box type with different distances so that all of them hit the same target curve at their respective seating locations. Do you want to keep doing this job forever? Or do you, is there other stuff you want to do in audio? I was audio hoping to retire. Photographer <laughs> in a like, few years, retire? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Hot air balloon? Hot air balloon, yeah, sure. It's hard for me to imagine getting away from audio. I think I'm probably interested in getting more into the product creation management mm. side, but still firmly with a foot in the field. I have good news for you. Uh -huh. DMB loves to make lots and lots of new speakers. Right. There's probably, how many models do you think are in this room? That's a good question. 40? <clears throat> do you know how many total models that there have ever been? I think at some point we made 45 models of subwoofer, including all of the installation variants and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's great that we have a product for every niche. It's really impenetrable for someone that's new to DMB to figure out what's what. One thing that I forget a lot until I get into the field and I'm up in a lift is how to adjust speaker aim. And I find myself like with a, holding a laser onto the front of the speaker and trying to adjust it. And then I can't really see the laser very well. I'm wondering what is the thing I should be siding at because I had a drawing, but I'm not sure if that's true. What process do you like, or how do you get into the field and say, I need this to be splayed out five degrees? So we make a mobile viewer app. So you can take your RayCalc file, open it on your phone, and get all of that important deployment data. Frame angles, splay angles, box count, which speaker wires to which amp, the kind of handy stuff. And then I think it's best practice to have a remote controlled inclinometer on top of the frame. And in DMB world, we call this an array site. So it is a laser and an inclinometer, as well as a hydrometer and thermometer, all in one unit. And it can be read and controlled while you're flying the PA from a handheld remote or we can plug it into the network and look at the readings at front of house. So the angle and the laser, which is green, to help you see outdoors, That's great. can be controlled while you're flying the PA, make sure you get the right angle, make sure that laser hits the right spot. Then you plug it into the network and the front of house engineer can see the temperature and humidity 
at the top of the array where it matters most because that's the part of the array that fires the furthest distance through the air. Oh, I was thinking you would need to know at the other end where it's received. That would also be valuable, but okay. who wants to run another cable to the opposite end Has of the Has somebody video? to hold it. Okay, so that's vertical angle, but then does that mm -hmm. also help you with horizontal? I guess you see the laser for the horizontal. You see the laser for the horizontal. And then you need some kind of a landmark to know mm -hmm. where it's supposed to be pointing at, probably a seat number or something. Sure. I also, I just have one of those cheesy electronic protractor things where you open up the scissors and it tells you what the angle is, <laughs> and I just use that to cite things and double check. Someone told me on Facebook recently what they do is look at the like a beam in the ceiling and that it could give you zero degrees. Uh -huh. And then I real and either they told me this or I realized I could draw on the ground then, use your protractor and go out five degrees, mm -hmm. and then when I'm either up in the lift or wherever, I can look down on that, and that could be another thing to cite with. Yeah, I think that makes sense too. But I think it's also important, from my point of view, the horizontal angle is going to be less important than the vertical angle. Particularly when we talk about loudspeakers with well-behaved off-axis response, as you go off-axis, you should be getting an even attenuation of frequencies. So even if it's not pointed exactly the right way horizontally, there's a little bit of fudging. The vertical angle of the frame and the pin angles are extremely important when we're using array processing because it's counting on precision between the way the PA is deployed and the geometry of the venue. Right, and, and it's I, only looking at the on-axis. It's looking space. at the on-axis elevation. And if your frame angle is off by one degree, that can really mess things up and actually have array processing work against you. So I tell people, if you don't have the time or the tools to be precise, you might not want to use array processing. I, I've wondered about that since I don't work with a lot of DMB PAs, I wonder how often people are going out and deploying something, loading R1, loading the preset, and that's kind of it, and how often they are booting up array processing. There's a bit of extra work, depending on the complexity of the room. I don't know, maybe that's too broad of a question. I'll put it to you this way. Yeah. If people are working with the larger and higher end series, so if they have SL series, if they have J, if they have V, I'd say there's a 90% chance they're using array processing and they've been to one of our workshops, they have their own expensive laser disto, maybe the fancy tripod thing. There's a helper tool in a ray calc to help you get the venue geometry in there. And that's gonna be great for ray processing. And then people using the smaller stuff, it's a little more like, I use a, a ray calc to tell me my splay angles and I made sure it was right and it's great, sound goes forward. So I make sure the speaker's pointed forward and have a great show. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if anything's changed since the last time we talked. I don't know if I already asked you this question, but what's recent, a lot of recent service calls you've been getting that, I don't know, that you just wish people knew? Do you want to do a PSA about <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> product questions that you're getting a lot recently? <laughs> yeah, I think that's great. There's a really common misconception out there that I want to address. When you're operating your system in R1, the DMB control system, that software is running and you save your file and you pack it up. That process is not actually saving your PA's audio settings. So far, you've only saved the layout of your control screens. They're saved in the amp. Right. All of those settings are running in the amp. They don't really need to be saved unless you find a situation where an amp fails and you need to replace the amp and push new settings to it. In which case, you're really going to wish you had the settings of that amp saved into the R1 file. So make sure you save a snapshot, or what we call system settings, into the file. This is the way that the software goes and confirms all of the settings of the devices, saves them into the file. Now you have something to recall later. Just saving the R1 file by itself is not actually logging your settings. Okay, and you want people to know this because you have gotten some frantic phone calls of people like, where are my settings, something like that? I love it. I'll visit a music venue that has a DMB PA and they have four or five sound operators and each one of them has their file for the settings they like. And I show up and they're like, it's the weirdest thing. I open my file and it still has Bob settings from yesterday. And I'm like, let me see your files. And there's no snapshot saved. So they're all just five of the same file with different names <laughs> on the file. They're not actually okay. recalling anything. Got it. Yeah. Or that question, I had an amp fail. What do I do now? I'm like, it's too late to get the settings off of it. Maybe, depending on how it failed. But. 
I remember in the class now with Chris and... Dave Thomas. Dave. They went over this a lot, talking about pushing and pulling of information, using R1 with the controller, because they get so many questions about that. And they were they made it really clear, but I can see that a year from now, maybe I, I will have forgotten, and I'll need to go and look again at what mm-hmm. gets pushed and what get, gets pulled, and what is the end-of-day procedure to uh-huh. store all that information. All right, let me give you a hypothetical situation that I think will describe to you why it works the way it does and what our approach is. Okay. Let's say you're the system engineer for Taylor Swift out with a DMBPA from 8 Day Sound. Let's say that. That sounds great. Sounds fun, right? <laughs> and... Show's going great, everything's wonderful, and out of nowhere, the computer just crashes. Computers never do that. But when they do, you want to be sure that when you reboot that computer and open your file, you want to be absolutely certain that you're not going to send the PA to some earlier state in the day when you saved last. So as long as you have the same device list and the same speaker types, it's always going to read from the PA and it's going to be your window into what's happening in the PA. And in order to make a change, you have to intentfully instigate either touching a button or a knob or recalling a snapshot. Otherwise, it will never push your settings. Got it. Fair enough? Sure. What's your favorite drink? (laughs) Right now, I'm doing a keto diet, and I'm not supposed to drink, but I refuse to (laughs) not drink, so I've resorted to vodka sodas. Are you in ketosis at this moment? <laughs> Feels like it. Feels like it. It feels painful. Uh-huh. Hey, I have All a question right. for you. All right. You've been hanging out here at the dojo for a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. What have you been doing? Taking measurements for Tracebook. So Tracebook is an online community for the exchange of loudspeaker reference data. And what's super cool about being here is that I have been, little by little, over the last couple of years reaching out to people to see like what manufacturers might want to get involved. So I reached out to you and I said, hey, can I come measure a bunch of your speakers? And you said, let me check. And then it happened. (laughs) And lo and behold, despite our reputation, we don't refuse to keep everything proprietary. (laughs) (laughs) And I felt like there was a pretty good shot because it's not like there are some manufacturers that it goes. There's a whole spectrum from manufacturers that don't have any information, and there's not even a drawing on a spec sheet, to manufacturers that have some GLL files, but not for their subwoofers, to manufacturers that have a lot of GLL files, but for some reason there's no phase data. So there's all these different variations, but then DMB has, uh, as far as I can tell, almost every speaker available as a GLL file, and there's phase data, and it's been third party approved. Or like somebody else did Mm. it, verified it. since all that information is there already anyway, I didn't. It didn't. It seemed like it would be agreeable to show that information on another platform. And the only difference is that you don't have to go through the GLL viewer. And this is it's recent. And I don't know. It's just another way for people to get access to that data now. And it can come get directly into their audio analyzer. So if they have a show tomorrow and they're using. V7P, which I was playing around with a lot today, then they can get that into their audio analyzer and have some kind of a reference then when they go out and measure it for the first time. And it's not something that you can export directly from a DMB product, and it's just not part of the workflow. You design your thing, you deploy it, but if you then want to use your own third-party thing, your smart, your cross-light, your REW, then it can be really nice to have something to look at right. before you just take a shot and like then you have a bunch of data and you're like, what? what is this? And there's no place in a ray calc where you see a spectrum. That's not part of the process. You see a lot of isobars and like heat maps and things like that, which is what you need for designing a system. And so for some people, this may be the first time they've ever seen the response of a speaker if they haven't looked at the GLL file. And if they have never seen, they may have only ever measured a speaker when it's a hundred feet away, not when it's a few feet away. That's the project. And thank you for having me. Yeah. It's (laughs) It's good having you. It's honestly been really amazing. I Hope that I can reach out to more manufacturers and do the same thing. Imagine a platform where we have 
almost every speaker in the world. And anytime you're doing anything and you want to say, I think there's some problem with my speaker. I wish there was a way I could prove it to myself that there is. Right. Oh, I can go and get somebody else's measurement. Is the high channel amp out of phase or is there one driver not responding or... I had a fun moment today where I was playing with those speakers and I pushed them out into the room. And then as soon as you get out into the room, more of the room gets involved in more reflections, think the data gets a little bit more messy. And I was trying to do this alignment, and I looked at it, and I thought, oh, it looks like maybe it needs a polarity inversion. And this was the first time where I really came to appreciate there's no option for a polarity inversion <laughs> in R1. <laughs> there's no way I could have screwed that up unless somehow the cable had a problem, and then that's a whole other issue if you have right. confidence problems with your NL4. <laughs> totally, yeah. Leave it to a German engineer to be like, why would you want to change the polarity? You know, what <laughs> the cable's wrong. Well, then you should fix the cable. <laughs> now, last time we talked, you did mention that you think that's going to get added for Soundscape or... Yeah, so the Soundscape processor, which is called a DS100, it's meant to do a lot of things like object-based mixing, emulated room acoustics, et cetera, et cetera. But at its core, it has 64 inputs and 64 outputs of audio routing through cross-point matrixing, input processing, output processing, and it's the first piece of gear made by DMB that has a polarity button. All right. And it has one on every input, and it has one on every output. So we went from not making a polarity button for 45 years to making a single device with 128 polarity buttons, which I can, I love, I appreciate it. But hey, if you want polarity on your DMB system, we've got a processor just for you. The next thing, there's going to be a DMB speaker with a cup for a pole mount. Oh, built in. Yeah. Actually, the E12 has one. Oh, okay. The E8 has one. Never mind. So there's a couple. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, hey, most of the subs have threaded holes for a pipe. You know what I want you to hear before you go? What's that? I want you to hear that tiny little 44S okay. in combination with that B8 sub, the sub that's the size of a suitcase. Okay. And I want you to picture that with a stand and that being a standalone PA. Maybe we should just show we'll just we should show the B8 in the video now so that people can see it. I'll Should grab I, it. You, you're you going to grab it? You can, you can talk about why it exists. Are you sure you can handle it by yourself? <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a subwoofer for the smaller applications. It's a pair of six and a half inch woofers in a base reflex cabinet that's about the size of a suitcase. So think of it for maybe home theater or the restaurant system. Maybe it's even, I don't know, built into the seat of a theater as an effect speaker. And of course. The seat of a theater, that's a good idea. Right? Gareth Owen on Bad Cinderella is using these as under balcony subs. So they're I'm mounted up subs. along the lighting pipe that goes along the balcony face, piped down, poking its face out under the balcony. And I think I said home theater, but you didn't want to commit to that. Home theater is fine. We do. People use DMB systems in little trade show booths okay. or control rooms at the Performing Arts Center or the Edit Suite at the sports facility or the restaurant system. And you said it fits in a 19-inch rack, uh -huh. which is funny. Right, and so I've talked to a couple front of house guys about putting this in their console under rack as their front of house reference system subwoofer. So in here, I guess, mounted down is an eight-inch driver. It's actually a pair of six and a halfs oh, that okay. are front mounted, believe it or not. Pair of six and a halfs, so the B8 means nothing. Means nothing. Okay, yeah. great. I was trying to Correct. be smart. That's no, the wrong thing. No, I'm afraid not, yeah. <laughs> and so that's borrowing some driver technology that came from the side firing drivers of the SL series. Those side firing drivers that not only put more energy forwards, but also cancel energy to the sides and rear. They needed to be surprisingly small with extremely high excursion. And that special kind of combination requires a different approach on a voice coil, different approach on a magnet with more magnetic flux next to the voice coil. All of that resulted in A-series, the B8 sub, the 44S, which is like a ridiculous amount of output for a very small package. If people want to come here and see this and learn things, where should they go to find like a calendar of events? Mm -hmm. dbaudio.com has a full calendar of in-person workshops and webinars. It also has on-demand tutorial videos. And you can always just send an email to support at dbaudio.com. Tell us where you're from. It'll get transferred to your local support peoples in your time zone and in your language, 
and you can ask us more questions. Great. And I'll recommend it. It's no cost. It is super easy to access. There's currently no platform. I mentioned this to you and you said that later on there will be a platform, but right now it's just a Zoom link and you just log in and later on they send you the recordings. I really appreciate how super easy they've made it. There's nothing to sign up for. It just comes to your email. We're hoping that when our education platform is in full swing, that'll be a great way for people to get the nuts and bolts stuff at their own pace, at their own schedule, then we can still have webinars. Just in time. Have them be more discussional and interactive and more of a community kind of event instead of a lecture. And I know you guys don't just do things here, so the workshop you have coming up next week, you'll do things here and you'll go where? Yeah, the workshop next week is the SL series workshop. So we're talking about the larger line arrays. We do the classroom portion in this classroom sized room. But as you can imagine, flying and listening to stadium PAs in here isn't going to work. <laughs> so we rent the arena in downtown Asheville and go in there with a rigor call, flying eight arrays, trying them in different configurations. Everybody gets hands-on rigging time, and then we get to listen to different array processing settings and evaluate what we're hearing, and we have a lot of fun. And we also have a similar classroom space in Long Beach, California. Okay. So finally, we have something for the West Coasters. Nick, this has been fun. Thanks again for having me this week. And I guess we should just end by you telling people how to get in touch with you if they want to. You can just send an email to support at DB Audio and say, I want to talk to Nick. They could transfer it to me. If you're really good at writing stuff down, it's N-I-C-K dot M-A-L-G-I-E-R-I at dbaudio.com. Cool. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. What's for dinner? That's <laughs> what we do in Asheville. We eat and drink. I and thought you were going to say we name things. <laughs> yeah, well, <I'm> not sure. <laughs>